I'm rolling right now, yeah. It looks sharp there. Three, two, one. Welcome to Dropping In from Omega Institute, a podcast that explores the many ways to awaken the best in the human spirit. I'm Callie Alpert. Dropping in today, Padraig Otuma. Padraig is a poet and theologian from Ireland whose work centers around themes of language, power, conflict, and religion. His poetry has received acclaim in circles of literature, psychology, politics, and theology, and has been published in the Harvard Review, Poetry Ireland, and the Academy of American Poets, among others. His books include readings from the Book of Exile, Sorry for Your Troubles, In the Shelter, and most recently, Poetry Unbound. Padraig also hosts the Poetry Unbound podcast from the On Being Project. He is a member and former leader of the Cory Mila community, Ireland's oldest reconciliation community. Padraig, welcome. Thank you so much for dropping in today. It's so good to see you. Thanks, Kali. It's lovely to be with you. So you grew up in Cork in the southwest of Ireland. And clearly Ireland has a very grand legacy of prominent writers and poets. Um, To the degree that people often say that uh, Irish people have storytelling and poetry in their blood and in their DNA. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? Because I have heard you talk about how you believe there's lots of cultures that have inherent storytelling in them, certainly. But what do you think it is about that's at the core of that legacy? Do you agree with it? And what do you think is at the core of that? Um, yeah, Ireland is one of the countries around the world where where poetry and storytelling is um, really prominent. Um, you can look to traditional culture for ways within which that was popular. Um, like the way that it's shown up in me is that like when I was going to school, it was just taken for granted that you'd be learning two poems off by heart every week, one in English, one in Irish, from the age of five to 17. And so that doesn't mean that everybody loves poetry or writes it, but uh, it does mean that when you have conversations with people about poetry, that people have opinions. <laughs> um, I did that latest book, Poetry Unbound, was launched in Dublin a month or two ago. And the way that I did the launches for that event was to say to whoever was there, what's a line from a poem that you call to mind? And uh, in Dublin, we could have just spent the whole hour of the book launch just letting those come forward. People just kept on calling things forward and finishing off each other's lines or correcting it if somebody got it wrong. Um, So certainly there is a way within which Ireland is one of the cultures where that's present. Um, Iran also, um, Palestine, so many places, Turkey, um, so many places around the world. Poland also, a very, very rich um, poetic culture there. So... Yeah, I'm very glad to have been part of a a culture and an education system, a very ordinary education system where just going along to the local village school, poetry was absolutely taken for granted, not only for its literary benefit, but also its historical and political benefit, because poetry in Ireland has always been, not always, but has had a long history of politics as well. Why do you think that is when you name those countries as examples of where it might be more deeply embedded from the get-go for um, people growing up in those cultures? I, I'm going to generalize here by saying, ha- having grown up in the United States, uh, in the Northeast of the United States, that often for me and a lot of children, it was more of a challenge to mm. befriend poetry than anything mm. else. So what do you think sets that apart? I'm not sure. Yeah, Um I suppose there's, by exposure to something, you become a lot more used to it. Like, for instance, whenever I go to Canada and people are like, oh, come on, let's go skating. And they just pop on skates and skate off over some frozen lake. Like, I'm frightened, A, I'm going to fall through the lake. And I also, I don't know how to skate. So, uh, but for other people, they were like, I've been doing this since I was five, you know. It's almost like somebody saying they don't know how to ride a bike or something. So I suppose partly it's whatever you're used to. And that just means that even if you don't love it, you have a familiarity with it and you have a capacity to say, here's why I don't like it or here's why that doesn't work for me. So there's something about that. If you only encounter poems from time to time, maybe a week every term in school, well, then that means that if you have a distaste for it, well, then you can avoid it most of the year. Whereas in Ireland, if you have a distaste for poetry, you probably have to hone your reasons for your distaste because you're saying you're facing it every day. Mm. So interesting. Mm. You, you've you talked about and written about poetry as prayer. Mm. Um, from what I've known and what I've learned in, in researching and getting to know you and your work a little bit better, um, those are two silos that obviously deeply define you. 
And I'm curious about those two things, the origins of them before they started to coalesce in you when you were a younger boy. Um, you're one of six kids in a family, right? You had an eye toward the priesthood early on. How did you discover your resonance with poetry separate from what we just talked about in terms of the cultural bit of it? Was there a time when you recall your heart really singing or knowing that this was your calling or one of your callings? Well, I just always liked it. You know, we were we were learning poems so early and learning complicated poems and learning poems written about middle age crises and politics and occupation and revolution. You know, you could recite loads of those in two different languages from the age of eight. So and I loved the sound of it. I, I, I always enjoyed learning things off by heart and I love the sound of the words in my mouth. So um, I mean, there was a way within which I grew up in a poor family. Both my parents had left school at 13, so they were absolutely committed to all six of us getting jobs in industry, in science, preferably. And while they had an appreciation for all subjects, they really were in terms of getting a job, science and particularly physics was the only way forward. Um, so the idea of of thinking that poetry was anything over other than a deep love of mine, that never really occurred to me way into my 20s. I just thought, well, it's it's part of my blood, but I never thought I was going to be able to do anything with it because an imagination of, of a career like that seemed like a, an untouchable luxury because I, I'm sure lots of people who have grown up where parents had to had to leave school at 13, you grow up as the children of such parents with a sense about what a job needs to mean <laughs> and, and what an employable skill looks like. So poetry never seemed like an employable skill. <laughs> Neither does theology, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, so it just always was there and it never had to be anything other than a deep love. And so there and I never had fantasies either about getting published. I just knew I had to write. And so I wrote and wrote and wrote um, and learned and got books about how to write um, and and was part of some small groups of people where we were, I was learning the, the steps of editing or editing yourself and writing in response to schools of poetry that I loved. So it, it always was there, but as something that was a sustenance and it, it never became any question about a profession for a long time. And I'm glad for that, that that was a good place. There's limitations to that part. Sometimes I wish I'd done a, an undergrad in poetry or, you know, different things like that. But there's there's a way within which the benefits of it to continue to be with me. And with prayer, I, I think I always knew that poetry and prayer are are overlapping with each other. They never were separate for me. Certainly um, in the Irish tradition, there's there's loads of prayers for all kinds of things. Mm. You were and loads of local prayers for all kinds of things. We were learning prayers about how to welcome your own death and how to pray for your own death. And lots of these prayers have um, um, a kind of a folk religion to them. They wouldn't necessarily be endorsed by the Vatican. Not that they're saying anything that would necessarily be contradictory to formal religion, but they have a they have a certain parochial anarchism to them that makes them seem very local. Um, and I loved those. There's one, you know, invoking all of these saints and angels to perch on the gables of your house, uh, some kind of protection. I always saw Mary and Bridget like vultures on the gables of the house. And I, I loved the imagination of that. And there was something of that that felt wild. And these are anonymous prayers. You may know where they come from or maybe not even that. Um, they're a few hundred years old and they've kind of evolved out of a certain tradition. So there's something about the invocation of such poems and prayers that, that, that demonstrates the enormous overlap. For me, the direction of prayer is much less interesting. It's, it's the source of it that is really interesting. And I think that prayer and poetry, one of their shared sources is the heart and what matters and human hunger and need. Those things really motivate and interest me when it comes to um, art. I want to go back to your reference just now about the prayers that had to do with welcoming your own death. Hmm. Were those things you were exposed to as a young boy? Oh, yeah. Or not until totally. adulthood? No, no, as a boy, totally. Every night we, we had these family prayers we prayed. And um, there's one in English that we used to say, um, uh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, may I breathe forth my soul in peace with you. Amen. And the, another one, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, assist me now and in my last agony. So there's a long tradition of um, 
uh, of of praying for your own death in in lots of cultures around the world and lots of religions. And I, I love that the Irish tradition does that. And partly too, what, what that imparts into you is an imagination that life is going to have struggle rather than that life is going to be easy. Not that I think that that therefore means, makes for pessimistic imaginations, but it does make for certain realistic imaginations to say, you know, death and struggle are part of this. And if the question of God means anything, it is the question of how, about how to be alive in the midst of those demands and unsureties and uncertainties, rather than thinking that um, any system of prayer should guide you through those without being impacted by, by difficulty or demand mm. or death. I love the idea of that. It sort of opens up the door and um, takes away, in theory, the fear or preciousness around topics that are often construed as too macabre for children to talk about, yeah. too macabre for, for adults to talk about, let alone yeah, kids, totally. right? Well, that's the way. I mean, children are very comfortable talking about death often and have very practical questions. I spoke to a man who was involved in publishing for young people a few years ago, and he was saying most of the complaints he gets are from parents of young people. Young people want in the literatures that they explore to look at questions of serious meaning, of power and of death and of the past and of friends and of breakages of friendships and all of these things that are really vital and sometimes catastrophic and serious and magnificent and the source of great electricity in life. And um, often he says that it is the people who say they're protecting the children from those things when actually they seem to be protecting themselves from it because they want to protect an imagination of childhood that seems to go against the very trends that the children that they say they're protecting would articulate for themselves, which is to say they want to recognize their world and the literature that they turn to. It's, it's sort of reminding me of um, just the overarching theme of people often being afraid of depth mm. and truth. Mm. I wonder if we've gotten away from that, generally speaking. I mean, certainly artists and poets and writers, that's, that's, some, that's their mission and plenty of other industries as well. Anyone that enjoys sitting around a kitchen table and having a chat with their friends or who, people who, with whom they live. Um, I mean, in a certain sense, Maybe at its best, social media can be a way within which people are engaging in conversations like that. You know, join the conversation is a phrase that you often hear when people are appealing for folks to join in on their social media feed. And that might be so they could have stuff sold to them. But also there might be a desire to think, oh, we can learn something and let's have a conversation. Obviously, that that can be complicated and can lead down to fruitless paths. But But conversation has always had that as a threat to itself, you know. Um, social media isn't the thing that showed that people can enjoy fighting. <laughs> people have enjoyed fighting for a long time before <laughs> social media. All social media does is maybe amplify it and reveal it back to us. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember once being invited to the house of a man for a meal. He was a bishop, a donal, and um, sitting around the table was this other guy who um, the bishop had met because this fellow had come to fit curtains in the house. And he that's what he did for his work. He fitted blinds and curtains in ho houses. And this man, Jim, just loved to have conversations. He loved to talk to people. And Jim and I kept in touch for a number of years because he was such a raconteur. And I loved that. There was there was a way within which like he wasn't trying to broadcast himself. He wasn't trying to think, oh, I need a career as a chat show host. I need to have a YouTube channel. Nothing. He was just thinking any opportunity I have to talk with people, fitting, you know, curtains in their house, being invited back, just getting involved in the lives of the people who he met. He is magnificent. And I, I find that all walks of life, all corners of communities have people who do that. And naturally, those people around that person will go, God, it's great when they're here because they really get us into a conversation, you know, and it, it might be very serious or it might be lighthearted, but nonetheless tender. And that's a that's a great joy. People who have that um, disposition are, are a gift to their friends and family and community. Yeah, absolutely. And from what I've heard and experienced, it's a great gift to them to have the captive, receptive people in order to engage in those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. as well, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Kind of works in a very circular, reciprocal way, ideally, yeah. right? If the conditions mm -hmm. are right, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I'd like to go back again to your uh, coming of age parts of um, which really deeply informed your work and, and your life. I think it was at age 12 when you knew that you were gay. Yeah, 11 or 12. And obviously that put you on the path to finding your way to living openly and to reconciling the prejudice around sexual orientations um, and reconciling that with your religion. I know you've said that you don't, you never struggled with your sexuality. You struggled with other people's struggles of your sexuality. Um, that was followed by the exorcisms and uh, reparative therapies. And I'm very um, interested in the degree to which that process early on at that stage either fractured or fortified your relationship with yourself. Hmm. Um, the idea of being up against as a young man, the idea of people attempting to hold you back from your own truth with you. Mm. Um, I think it certainly uh, limited the imagination about what was possible and what was what was fruitful and what was loving and what was good. You know, when in in a certain sense, I'm I'm a good Catholic in in that I I looked to authority and I trusted authority. I don't know. <laughs> I did then to um to have my best interests at heart when it came to saying what was what was true and right and proper and good and what was an interpretation of ancient texts also and i i i was looking for the parameters within which to explore freedom and the parameters were very very limited and that certainly contributed to a great sense of of constraint um yeah, there was a, a deep sense of constraint within that. I mean, years later, I tend to think about that within a conversation about form and poetry, you know. So for me, the relationship with sonnet or villanelle or pantoum or triolet, any of these things is is an ongoing conversation with the question about what kind of freedom can be found within form and constraint. So in a certain sense, my um, those early years were a long study about the reality of that when it came to a life and safety and systemic abuse and systemic prejudices. Um, they were, they were, um, they were a, a boiler for fury and resentment and rage. It was a a place within which um, language was trying wherever it could to explode through me. Mm -hmm. And I was, for a while anyway, trying whatever I could do to dampen that explosion. And uh, in a certain sense, it's a recipe for a disaster of a life. And certainly I've lived with some of the consequences of that. Um, it is also a recipe for fortitude if you're lucky enough to have some some small modicums of support. Um, I really did feel very alone for a long time, um, but I'm glad for the kind of private space that poetry created in me to have conversations with myself on the page. Poems I'd sometimes burn afterwards because I couldn't bear the idea that anybody would find them. Mm -hmm. But but releasing those onto the page was a great was a great um self writing and uh, uh, um treating your own story as some kind of sacred text. Have you ever thought about how that um fire in your soul to write and express yourself would perhaps be different if you hadn't had those experiences? I do, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's a question we all ask, isn't it? It's a speculation about what would life, who would I be had life been different? Um, and I, I, there was a while when I used to think that such speculations were worth were worthless. Um, I, I, I don't think they're worthless and I also don't think they're worthwhile engaging in too much. I, I do think about it from time to time. It would have been like, nice to have had a life where uh, certain things weren't such a struggle. <laughs> I would like that, but then I, were I to have had that life, I wouldn't know what that what, what the alternative is like. <laughs> I only ever know what I know, um, and I, I'm sure that's the same with all of us. Um, Aviva Zornberg, who's an extraordinary writer um, about Hebrew Bible and about psychoanalysis and about linguistics and etymology, she looks at the story of Moses and. Um, she looks at how it, how it is toward the end of his life that he he realizes certain things for himself, and perhaps he realizes with a with a tinge of regret that he hadn't learned those things earlier. And I, I think there's such an interesting realization that that preoccupation 
about, oh, I wish I'd learned that earlier or I wish I had the freedom then that I have now, that that has been present in literatures for millennia. And in that sense, I, I feel in good company. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not burdened by regret, but I do sometimes kind of flirt with it a little bit. Mm. I um, appreciate the idea of not perseverating about the rearview mirror and going backwards. Mm. Although yeah. often people, you know, it's, it's helpful to understand how exactly. we're formed and where we came from. Yeah. Um, I'm probably more curious now with you about where you think great art and, and um, work and writing comes from. And are those experiences we're talking about a great catalyzer? Are they necessary? Are they not necessary? All the cliches about the greatest rock songs being, you know, written because of deep pain and agony mm -hmm. and poetry being written by, from deep uh, pain and agony. So that's sort of the, um, the bridge I was trying to build between your past and your beautiful work yeah. now, you know? Um, I suppose... Well, I mean, if we knew if we knew where art came from, we would keep going there, even mm. if it hurt us. And so ultimately, we don't. Um, certainly, one of the things that we can say is that heightened experience of need can distill the need for expression and focus that out in a certain way, whether that's dance or music or or community work or poetry. Um, and then it's down to, I suppose, what, what's present in a culture or in a life in terms of the, the expressions. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I know of people who write poems of extraordinary tenderness and yet for them, it's really an experiment in language. Uh, and while I might want to go, what's the devastation that gave rise to this? They'll go, look at the alliteration. <laughs> um, and, and in that way, we don't know. Um, Yeats used to talk about the is it animus mundi, the, the soul of the world, and had this idea that there was a soul of the world that was trying to make its way out through all the artists. And he had a very spiritist way of looking at it to think that certain symbols or certain colours or certain words or numbers were a demonstration of this soul of the world. And I mean, the, the kind of particularity of that isn't something that appeals to me. But what I think he is getting at is that sometimes we're doing something that feels bigger than us. And that the question as to why this particular piece of poetry has come through this particular poet, um, that that isn't always the question that will solve the mystery of the tenderness or the insight of that poem. And then similarly, I mean, I, maybe people say the same thing about me, you know, there, there's, um, there's poems that you go, oh, I know that if I ever were to meet the poet who wrote this, I would really get on with them because they've written this with such perfection that, you know, I, I feel like I've been birthed through this poem. And then you meet them and they're ordinary or they're an asshole or they're tired or whatever, you know, or the connection's not there or they're distracted or they have a toothache or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It can be any of these things. And it, and you can come away thinking, oh, well, therefore the art is meaningless because there wasn't that connection. And that's unfair to the art as well. And so the question as to the relationship of the artist to the art is, is is a perplexing one. And often it's perplexing to the artist as well. I love how you said that too, the, uh, the idea of sourcing where art comes from. That's just such a large question and also so beautifully simplified. <laughs> you know, I love, I haven't heard it put like that. I love that. Some of your themes on, among many that you write and speak about often um, are subjects around truth, shadow, secrets do you um can you tell me why let's start with the shadow can you tell me why that topic has been so deep for you over the years hmm. and perhaps it's not right now well partly there is a linguistic explanation to this that the word for shadow and shelter are the same in irish ska um and i i loved that because in some ways of rendering those in English, shelter can seem like it's a great benefit and shadow can feel like there's something that's being erased. Now, here's the thing. On a sunny day, I'm delighted to be in shadow. So even even English demonstrates um, a, a sophistication about the question about shadow and shelter. Um, 
but I always was fascinated by this Irish phrase, or ska hail of water snavina. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live, or mm. it is in the shadow of each other that the people live. I've heard some people say that the word, the verb live there can mean survive as well. You know, there's, there's, there's ways within which this very simple old saying can, can extend in multiple directions. And deeper than any question as to whether shelter is good and shadow isn't so good is the question for me about what it means that there are more than one, that there is more than one thing that's true at the same time. And that's what really interests me in the question of shadow and shelter, in the question of truth also, in the question of story, and ultimately in the question of language. How is it that you can say something that um, that demonstrates that there's more than one th true thing? Often poets are looking for a phrase of elegance that has multiple immediate interpretations and where the interpretation isn't provided. So I wrote a poem for my friend Phil years ago called um, Readings from the Book of Exile. And one of the parts of that poem says he has been moved beyond belief. And I was really pleased with that line because, um, yeah, he had been moved beyond belief in all the ways that, that could mean about the question of moving away from belief, about the question about being moved and that it being unbelievable, the level to which he had been moved and then everything that happens in between that. And for me, I like to explore truth and shadow and shelter through particular narratives that have multiple immediate interpretations. That sounds very, that sounds like, it, it sounds overly complicated, but it's not. We use those kinds of sentences all the time when we're talking about our, when we're talking about each other to say, um, yeah, that took it out of me. Wow, it took what out of me? Or I was beside myself with emotion. What? I was beside myself? We mm. use those phrases when we're talking to our friend on the bus or making a new friend or talking to a therapist or on a retreat at Omega. All of these places, we, we find ways within which the language we use is presenting itself to us in absolute particular grounded ways that have multiple interpretations immediately present. And I find that to be very interesting. And I find there's great poetry present there. So in your writing, is there an intentionality in that being the outcome or does it happen organically and it's not till afterwards when you're reading back your own sentiment that you recognize all the multifacets of what you just described? I suppose it's a mixture. You have an ear attuned for where that, where a particular line comes. I remember hearing somebody say, oh God, I was beside myself and just thinking, what? I've heard that phrase my whole life and suddenly I'm looking at it and I'm being looked back at by it. So sometimes there is a way within which there's a bit of a, an attunement to the possibility that's there. So sometimes you're pursuing it. Um, and other times you're just writing and finding out what's what you're writing and feeling as it's writing you back. You know, a poem, mm. the word poem in Greek, poemia, means a made thing. And a poem is a made thing that somehow makes you back and also has the capacity to break you as it looks back at you. And I think the world has had a long, a long standing relationship with, with poems as made things um, for as long as we've been people. And, uh, and not just by people who call themselves poets. You know, if, if there's been an amazing headline that captures a zeitgeist of joy or grief for a, a country or for a community, well, then it'll be on everybody's lips because somehow it makes and breaks them all at once or it brings them into that emotion, you know. Uh, a photograph can do the same thing where somebody captures a moment of joy or bliss or sorrow or lament or defiance on the front of a newspaper. And it just captures something where people feel like something in me is brought out as well as given space for lament in this. And and in that way, I, I am I'm attuned to looking out and listening out for those pieces of language as well as I'm aware that the poem is trying to work itself through me and sometimes the um, the deliberate crafting of it can get in the way of letting the poem just be groaned out of you. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by uh, resonance of artistic work and how some feels like it can resonate with large groups of people and readers at the same time from very different walks of life as a great reconciler in honor of a lot of your work. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you put your finger on what that is? And do you find it? Is there hope inside of that, perhaps, that that's a a great equalizer in the human experience, which is something you focus so much on? Mm -hmm. That may be uh, the idea that when people's hearts are open and they're allowing themselves to receive one Mm -hmm. piece of work, you know, in the same way, that there's a, a collective experience going on that maybe can bond us. You know, it's sort of a big multi-layered question, but it's what's coming to me as I listen to you talk mm. about that. Well, it's interesting. Um, I, I have thought about this, you know, I've done public readings of work for years, loads of poets have, and there can be all kinds of layers between that, you know, um, something that immediately you can feel the emotion erupting in the room or feel the resonance happening in the room that can make you feel like, okay, that was a good poem that, that did it. And somebody else who has a poem that might actually need a little bit more rereading might feel like, oh, therefore my poem's a failure or my poem's more sophisticated because it's not, it's not immediate. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds it's of over their heads. It. It's over their heads. I'm too clever <laughs> or, they're, or they're too stupid or, or, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to be tabloid or, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in praising one at the expense of the other. I'm interested in thinking, isn't it great that there's all kinds of things that are present there in different things you return to at different times. Um, so yeah, I never, I never know what causes resonance. Partly, I think what causes resonance is expectation and hope. And for me, what happens in a room when poems are being recited is as much to do with who's in the room and what's drawn them to the room than the words that are being given. And so that does give me pause, um, to, pay, to not automatically think that because something has landed perfectly in a room that it's because of my perfect poem. Maybe it's because of the generosity of the people in the room mm. and the way that they've brought themselves to the room. So I think about that a lot. You're beyond being a recognized and revered and renowned poet and writer and storyteller. Um, you have quite a reputation as a public speaker. I, I even in full disclosure have cried many times just listening to you talk because there's a soulfulness uh, and a visceral experience that happens by listening to you. Mm. And I'm curious what the experience is for you, the difference between how you feel when you're writing a poem, when you're reading one of your poems, and when you're speaking um, extemporaneously about whatever topic of the myriad of topics you talk about. How does it feel for you, those three things? I I try as far as possible to let each of them feel close to each other. For me, I'm interested in having a relationship with language that is able to look at need and, and hunger and possibility and curiosity and rage and emotion and desire and lust and fury and reclamation that all of these things that are primal i i i want when i'm writing when i'm editing when i'm giving a a formal talk and when i'm in conversation with friends i i want to be present to all of those things um and and that it is the it is the openness to to those hungers and the openness to recognizing that they're always there anyway that that's the that's the template by which I, I measure the, the integrity of anything that I say in public. Do you feel differently when you're in each of those different actions? Does your experience differ between speaking, reading, writing? No. I mean, there can, of course, you know, if, if, if you feel like, oh, that didn't land well, or there, there's ways within which the experience can feel bad afterwards. But in ter- for me, the question is always, can I walk away paying attention to what I've written or what I've said or what I've heard or how I've listened? Can I walk away feeling like I was able to be myself there? Mm. And th- that's, the, that's the deepest question of integrity, I think. That's mm. a good gauge. <laughs> how aligned was I with myself in that moment or at that place or with that person? Yeah. Do I recognize myself? Was mm. I performing a different self? And, and if I was performing a different self, is that self true too? Who is that other self? You know, I, there isn't, none of these things have simplistic answers to them. But I, yeah, there, 
there's something more than did I get applause that it, that that is an invitation to a quiet that is an invitation I think yeah did I tell the truth did I ask the truth did I did I hold the question from a place of need did I deliver a talk from the point of view of the assumption that I know something and others don't those are those are questions that and those are dispositions and postures that I always want to ask so I'd asked you um, before our time together today, if you would come with a poem or two that might reflect where you're yeah. at now in, in, in your yeah. heart and your head. Do you want to share one? Yeah. There's one here called Let the Waters Swarm with a Swarm of Living Beings. It's kind of my take on um, a convention that you find in the opening poem of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible that talks about the, the, the um, creeping things that creep upon the earth. Um, so let the water swarm with a swarm of living beings. I've been swimming around here for a while now, and while I've never touched the ocean floor, I've tried. You notice things out here, the way the wind makes waves chop at odd angles, the way the water feels warmer at the top, the way the moon makes music when you're half dead with cold, the ways of frozen bones, the way the morning never feels the same. Once a seal bumped me, came right up to me like a sea poppy, and I swear it smiled. I was floating happy after that. I said the ocean was my home. Then the storm came. Then the waves, then the lightning spiked the surface. Thunder clapped. Hungry beasts swam round me. I saw seagulls eyeing me for scraps. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Why did you pick that one? Where are you at in relationship to that theme right now? I like the last line. Hungry beasts swam around me. I saw seagulls eyeing me for scraps. Um, I suppose there's a question about time in this. Um, this person seems to be abandoned at sea and, and thinks because they had one beautiful experience, you know, the seal comes up and smiles that therefore they go, OK, I know the lay of the land now or the lay of the water. And then things change, you know, the, the, the storm, the lightning, the, the beasts. Um, and sometimes I'm the beast and other times I'm the water and other times I'm the lightning. Uh, all these things, of course, in a poem like this, it isn't just the speaking voice that is the persona. The persona is all of these characters that are present in the furniture of the poem. And for me, it, I, I like the invitation of this to think about which one am I today? Am I the sea puppy? <laughs> am I the hungry beast? Am I the seagull? Am I the water? Which one am I? Um, I, I like the curiosity of that, the um, the nature of of wildness that's present in some of these characters, and the nature of preservation that's present in some of the other characters, and um, the tension between them. I also felt uh, some type of meditation inside of there, with the reminder of how transitory everything is, all the yeah. time. Yeah, there's a great line in Lord of the Rings where one of the hobbits says to a king that he's just sworn his fealty to, as a father you shall be to me. And this king is nearing the end of his life and has developed some wisdom <laughs> at cost. And so when the hobbit says, as a father you shall be to me, the king says, for a while. And I love that um, modification of that sentence, for a while. And you get the you get the sense that in Tolkien, this was him looking back at various versions of himself, um, where as a younger person he might have said, "This is how it's always going to be," and an older part of him is saying, "Yeah, for a while." And mm -hmm. just because it's not going to be permanent, it doesn't mean that therefore its impermanence is ineffective. I have goosebumps for what that's worth. <laughs> I do. So finally, 
I have three questions that I like to ask everybody that joins us on dropping in three rapid fire questions as Great. they are. Um, I'd like to grant you one wish for our listeners and our viewers. What would it be? Uh, that the British royal family would uh, initiate a global truth and reconciliation or truth commission um, regarding the impact of empire. What is something you wish for yourself? Um, isn't it interesting how difficult it is to say that? On the one hand to grasp it and then the other hand to think, what will I say that I can um, be with right now? What do I wish for? Um, I'm tired, so um, probably a bit of rest. <laughs> and finally, what's the most important offering or tip you'd like our viewers and listeners to take away from our conversation today? If one thing. Oh, oh um, to notice. Thank you so much, Padraig. It's been such a joy to talk My with you today. Colleague. I've loved both times I've been at Omega and I've been on this podcast too. So thank you. It's a lovely opportunity. Well, it's a gift anytime mm -hmm. we can have you join us as well. So I really appreciate it. If people would like to find out more about you and your endeavors, where can they look for you? Um, so they can listen to Poetry Unbound. That's a podcast. So you'll find that wherever you podcast your podcasts. Um, there's, uh, I have a website, Um I'm on Instagram with the same, just my name, Podrigotuma. So you can follow along there. We're, yeah, Have a look around. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for dropping in with Omega Institute. If you like what you see, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. To listen to the audio version of Dropping In, find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Dropping In is made possible in part by the support of Omega members. Omega members enjoy a host of beneficial experiences when they donate to help sustain Omega's programming. To learn more, visit eomega.org slash membership. And check out our many online learning opportunities featuring your favorite teachers and thought leaders at eomega.org slash online learning. I'm Callie Alpert, producer and host of Dropping In. Our video editor is Granel Knox. The music and mix are by Scott Mueller. Thanks for dropping in. Dropping In.